Okay, so thank you everybody for joining us today for today's International Barley Hub Seminar. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Paolo, um, Andrea, Ernesto and Tancredi. Um, this seminar is called Best Crop and Record Bar and it's going to be focusing on two of these large scale EU projects which involve lots of different partners from across the EU um, and academic and industry um, scientists as well. So first of all um, we're going to hear from Paolo Pesarese um, and uh, his PhD student Andrea Pesello. They're both based at the University of Milan and they'll be talking to us about Best Crop which is an EU funded project that started last year and involves 18 different project partners. Um, so, as always, please put your questions in the chat um, and I'll just hand over now to Paolo. Thank you, Kelly. Good morning, everybody. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Best Crop Consortium, I would like to thank the International Barley Hub to give us the opportunity to present um, the Best Crop Project. As, uh, as Kelly was saying, uh, the Best Crop Project uh, is a, a research project supported with uh, 6 million euros. Around five of them comes from the European Union and uh, slightly less than 1 million is provided by the UK Research Innovation Agency. This crop means uh, boosting photosynthesis to deliver novel crops for the circular bioeconomy. It's uh, a project of five years and the project involves uh, 18 partners. We have 10 university and research institutes. Uh, specifically, we have the University of Milan. Here we have three groups involved. My one, the one of Laura Rossini, and the third one of David Horner. We have then also in Italy, University of Padua, with a group of Thomas Morosinotto. And in Italy is also located at the uh, uh, CREA Research Institute with a group of Luigi Cattivelli and Alessandro Tondelli. Then we have two institutions from Scotland, the James Hutton Institute and uh, the, the group of uh, Kelly and Robbie, as well as uh, the group of uh, Claire Alpin at, uh, um, uh, um, at the University of Dundee, as you can see here. Then we have uh, Dusseldorf, the University of Dusseldorf. Also here, two groups are involved. There is the group of Andreas Weber and also uh, the group of Enzel Goetz, both coming from the University of Dusseldorf. And there is the group of uh, um, uh, Anne Skollist from the University of Tartu in Estonia. We have the group of Metz Hanson from Lund University. And then we have a group of Nicolas Lemoyne, uh, uh, IMT Minéale, as well as the group of uh, Ivo Frebort at the Catherine Institute in Czech Republic. These are our uh, research partners. And then we have also eight companies, companies that are involved in the breeding and sick sector. Certainly you can recognize here Nordic Sea, AWS, and also SIS, Società Italiana Samenti. They are all dealing with the uh, lines, breeding and sick sector, as well as Uzovsko from the Czech Republic. And then we have companies instead involved in the production of bio-based compounds like Mogu and Sogis, they are both from Italy, and we have also um, FRD Codem from France. And finally, our um, uh, last partners, uh, it's a um, consortium Israel Biotech, they are mainly involved in the management of the project and also in uh, um, uh, running uh, analysis related to the life cycle assessment and the uh, technical and economical feasibility of the technology that we plan to establish uh, towards the best crop project. Now, the major ambition of our project is uh, to develop uh, next generation barley plants that have three main uh, characteristics. These lines should have increased uh, CO2 and ozone uptake. In general, we expect that they will have a total biomass production, at least based on proof of concept currently available in literature, by 15 20% without touching the harvest index. And this increase uh, in biomass production um, 
we expect that at least the, the, the straw will have uh, uh, very specific characteristics uh, that fits the needs of our industrial partner that are all involved in the, in the, in the circular economy sector. And so the straw barley should be then modified in order to be used as feed for animal or as substrate to produce biolubricants or also constructions or insulation panels as well as polymer composites. The best crop um, experimental plan is organized in nine different uh, work packages. The first part is dedicated to select uh, lines, genes, allelic variants that are responsible of the traits we are interested in. This is specifically the HEMA work package one and two. Then the traits will be stuck together uh, according to a specific breeding program. And of course, we aim to analyze the performance of, of the lines carrying together the different selected traits, uh, both under control and under, uh, later on under, under field condition. In particular, with respect to this first part, we are interested in uh, two main aspects. The first one is try to increase the photosynthetic performance of barley lines at the level of the canopy. And in particular, here in Milan, and in collaboration with the group of Metz and Lund University, we are interested in, uh, for, in uh, reducing the antenna size of, uh, of barley, therefore the content of chlorophyll in the leaves, in order to allow a better penetration of light towards the canopy. And this will be combined also with a different architecture of these lines, and in particular by introducing uh, phenotypes that are characterized by red leaves. We also aim to increase the ability of barley plants to adapt to rapid changes in light condition, as you can see in this moving, by changing and improve and making faster the kinetics of non photochemical quenching and by introducing also flavodiaron proteins. Moreover, we aim uh, in collaboration uh, with the group of Hannes Collis at the University of Tartu to uh, modify the regulation of stomata opening in order to increase CO2 and ozone uptake. And finally, in collaboration with the group of Andreas Weber at the University of Dusseldorf uh, by using a, a genetic engineering approach, we aim to introduce a, a photorespiration bypasses uh, in order to increase the efficiency of Rubisco to fix CO2. This will be the part uh, uh, that will be um, carried out uh, in a work package one and is dedicated to increase in general the uh, photosynthetic performance at the level of the canopy. The second part instead will be dedicated to um, um, improve uh, or adapt the quality of barley straw to the circular bioeconomy needs. And in particular, at the University of Dundee, the group of Claire Alpin will be dedicated in exploring natural genetic variability uh, with respect to lignin content in the straw. Uh, Claire has uh, more, uh, several hundreds of, uh, of barley lines, uh, spring barley lines, with different content of lignin. The lignin content can range from around 19% up to 29%. And besides that, she also uh, owns a set of lines that have been modified by genetic engineering in, in a linear content. On the other hand, the group of Luigi Cattivelli and uh, Alessandro Tondelli at CREA, they are focused on um, protein content in barley straw. They have two collection of uh, barley lines. Uh, one of them uh, was provided by uh, Icarda, and this collection has a different contents of a protein in the barley straw that range from slightly less than 4% up to 6.5%. And the aim is uh, to, to explore this natural genetic variability in terms of lignin and protein content to, to adapt, as I said, the, 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 the characteristics of the barley straw to the needs of the company in order to be able to produce uh, um, panels uh, or to produce uh, uh, feed for animal as well as uh, biolubricants. Now, 
as I mentioned, we will use, we will profit of different uh, genetic material. There will be uh, a lot of mutants that will be provided by the different partners, mutants that have been obtained and already characterized in, uh, in previous projects and they will be entered directly our breeding program. We will search for new line, for, for new mutants by a tilling approach thanks to, to the uh, chemically uh, induced mutant population in the background laureate made available by our partner James Hutton. And also, we will use a large collection of mutants with a reduced uh, chlorophyll content in the leaves made available by Matt Sanson at uh, Lund University. Furthermore, we will exploit, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, natural genetic variability. Uh, we will run a little mining analysis uh, uh, thanks to the facility available at the James Sutton Institute, in particular the Kranakan database, where we have around um, the data for uh, more than 1,000 sessions related to, to exon capture, and that include wild barley, land raises, and, and cultivars. But we will also, as a, as a I mentioned uh, just a few seconds ago, those uh, uh, population, uh, those germoplasma uh, in the lab of Claire Alpine and in the lab of Luigi Cattivelli uh, that have different content in lignin and proteins. We were also, we were also able to generate novel mutants and novel genetic material by exploiting gene editing and genetic engineering. Uh, two of our partners uh, will may available their platform of running this. Uh, experiments, and in particular, this will be the lab of Enzer Goetz at the University of Dusseldorf and the lab of Ivo Frebort at the Catherine Institute in Czech Republic. In work package three, that is led by CREA, um, we will stack together this trait. In particular, according to this breeding uh, scheme developed by Alessandro Tondelli, we aim to bring together photosynthetic mutants and mutants uh, um, uh, with uh, alteration of the canopy architecture. And then by this trait will be stacked also with the elite cultivar provided by uh, Claire Alpine with the different content in uh, lignin and also um, the ones provided by uh, by the CREA with the different content in, uh, in, in proteins and also other mutants uh, with uh, a different regulation of uh, uh, stomata opening will, will be, be uh, introduced into the breeding program that will uh, start from year one up to year four. And these lines, as I was saying at the beginning, will be then uh, analyzed under greenhouse condition, under control condition. And later on, starting from uh, here three, uh, we will uh, profit of the facility of our um, industrial partner involved in, uh, in, the, in the breeding and seed sector like KWS, SIS, Uzovsko, and Nordic Seed. We will uh, profit of their facility to grow these lines under field condition and to test their performance uh, under, under the real environment. That's related to, to the genetic material and it will be the, main, the first part of, of the best crop. In the second part, as you can see from the scheme, we will instead more focus on uh, uh, analyzing the property of the, the line that we have selected with different uh, content on lignin and proteins. And we will also try to test the life cycle um, feasibility and also the economical feasibility of these, uh, of these lines and the technology that we want to, to develop. Specifically, we will take the lines with a different property in the straw and we will analyze them for the cell wall composition and for their physical chemical proteins. And then we will use them to transform into animal feed and biolubricants. That's uh, one of our main objectives. And we will also um, use this uh, this uh, new barley line with the improved property of the straw to produce uh, insulation panels, construction panels, and uh, polymer composites. This is actually the main aim of uh, the company that are dealing with the production of bio-based compounds. Specifically, our partner Sogis will take. Uh, 
the barley line with an increased content on protein. We use them as a feeding material for this uh, uh, insect, the black soldier flies. And uh, uh, the black soldier fly, the larvae of this insect specifically, will feed, uh, will eat the, the, the barley straw, and they will be able uh, to produce fatty acids for the production of biolubricants, but also high uh, protein with a, a, a high added value that we will use for animal feed. Mogu instead will use this improved uh, barley straw in combination with the mycelia of ascomycets. Uh, this mycelia will be used as a natural binder uh, together with, uh, with the straw fibers in order to produce uh, insulation panels and also panels that can be used for creating furnitures. And finally, Mogu in combination with Fardecodem and the EMT partner uh, in France, they will also use uh, uh, barley straw, barley fiber to produce construction panel and polymer composites in a frame of the circular bioeconomy. So we provide value to uh, something of low value uh, like is uh, uh, barley straw at the moment. Starting from uh, um, year four, uh, we plan to have demonstrator uh, under uh, both field in, uh, in our uh, field trials, but also in the companies that transform the barley straw. In particular, you see here that in Italy at the facility in Crea, in Germany at KWS and in Denmark and Nordic Sea, we will uh, uh, cultivate the, the selected barley lines and we will uh, invite the, um, in the stakeholders, but also to the scientific community to see how these lines perform under real environmental condition. Um, Uzosco in Czech Republic have a specific license to cultivate the uh, gene edited or, uh, um, or lines that have been transformed by genetic engineering. And so there we will cultivate uh, lines that have been modified in the, in the set of traits that I just listed uh, before, but these, these lines are being obtained by, as I said, gene, um, uh, gene editing or genetic engineering since there they have the possibility to grow, uh, to grow these lines. And also there, uh, there will be the possibility to, to look at the performance of this line under real condition. In addition, our partners that are deals instead with the, pro, with the transformation of barley straw, both Mogu and Sogis in the north of Italy and FR Decodem in France, they will show you how you can transform barley straw into biolubricants, into proteins, into insulation panel, into construction panel or polymer composites. Finally, we will, sh we will use uh, this uh, uh, specific scenario in Italy where we grow the barley lines, the selected barley lines nearby the places where we are going to transform the barley straw into proteins and biolubricants, sojis number five, or into insulation panel, mogu number six. So this will create a, a real scenario where you grow your plants nearby the place where you transform later on the barley straw. And this obviously will provide uh, uh, us with data to make our life cycle assessment and technical and economical feasibility of the technology. To conclude, these are us at our kickoff meeting in Milan that took place uh, the 27th and the 28th of uh, of July, and the project, as Kelly was saying, started the 1st of July 2023. And uh, obviously, you can follow us uh, all uh, uh, updates uh, on uh, data that we are going to collect uh, during the realization of the best crop uh, uh, following our website at the www.bestcrop.eu and also on our social at LinkedIn, X, and Facebook. And now, I leave the stage to, to, Alice, uh, to Andrea Percello. Uh, he's a PhD student in my lab, and he will show you some uh, details of the activity we are running currently within uh, Work Package 1. 
Thanks, Paulo. So, good afternoon, everyone. And yes, I'm going to present the latest updates uh, on the work package one, uh, task 1 task 1.1 optimization of light canopy. And uh, in the best crop in our group, we will focus on the studying the pale green phenotype. Uh, so, the optimization of light canopy absorption by a reduction of the antenna size. Because this was observed that uh, the pale green phenotype offers several advantages, like a reduced nitrogen input, a reduced water input, so a better water use efficiency, uh, an improved uh, light absorption along the entire canopy, and not only uh, uh, in the upper portion of the canopy. And uh, I reduced the transpiration, so linked to the better water use efficiency and uh, overall and increased the yield of the of the plant. Next, in uh, in our task, we will follow two main approaches: a forward genetic approach, in which we will start from a mutant collection of chlorine mutants provided by Professor Matenson, and we will. Uh, uh, screen this uh, population but for chlorophyll content and photosynthetic uh, performance and in this way we will select uh, uh, new lines that will be biochemical and genetically characterized in order to obtain either new alleles for breeding or new target genes that will be used uh, also in the reverse genetic approach next so here is the reverse genetic approach in which uh, we start from uh, known target genes uh, and more uh, others will come from the forward genetic approach. Uh, these genes will be uh, used for allele mining, searching for natural variation in the Karnakachan database, and for tilling, so searching for um, induced variation and, uh, in uh, mutagenized populations made available uh, by the James Hudson Institute. And these lines will be selected, uh, phenotyped, selected, and uh, characterized uh, as uh, previously indicated. Next. During the screening of the chlorine mutant collection uh, for chlorophyll content using, using the SPAD instrument and yield, photosynthetic yield using a fluorimeter, the antipair, we were able to select uh, seven pale green lines showing a uh, reduced uh, chlorophyll content, stable uh, along the, the initial uh, stages of the plant, and, uh, and a photosynthetic efficiency either higher than the wild type or comparable to the wild type. Next. So here is an example of the Chlorina 104, which is a true a pale green phenotype, and we tested the photosynthetic efficiency uh, of uh, PS1 and PS2 under uh, uh, increasing light uh, intensities uh, using a fluorimeter, the dual pump. And as we, uh, as we can see, the yield of the system 2 is stably uh, wild type like along all in light intensities, while the yield of 1 of the system 1 is uh, increased in respect to the wild type. Next. So this line will be genetically characterized by whole genome sequencing. Uh, and we are currently mapping the mutations. Uh, below you can see some uh, raw data of the, of the process, the mapping process, and SNP calling. And once we will have the candidate mutations, they will be validated. This line uh, are also being introgressed in elite cultivar. Uh, and at this moment, uh, RGT planet, and we are currently in the Becos one F1. And this, um, let's say, um, cleaned lines will be used for biochemical physiological characterization, seed propagation, and uh, the field following field trials. Next. In the reverse genetic approach, instead, we focused uh, at the moment for uh, different target genes related. Uh, either to uh, chlorophyll synthesis, like CHLI or BCM1, the 
loading on the thylakoid membranes of, of the light harvesting complex proteins, like the SRP43, but also proteins related to the non photochemical quenching process uh, related to energy dissipation. But new target genes will be uh, obtained uh, through the sequencing of the chlorina mutants and they will be included in the forward genetic approach. Next. Uh, as uh, Professor Bezarezi said before, uh, these traits will be um, stacked together uh, into a predict strategy. And at the moment, we uh, provided the, the BECOS 3F1 and BECOS BECOS 2F3 um, lines of two different pale green mutants, the TM2490 and the AS1 mutant, to our partner uh, Korea in Firenzuola for introgression energy to planet uh, propagation and of course uh, 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 trade and uh, stacking trades. Uh, AS1 is an already published uh, mutant, but the TMT TM3490 is under publishing, so I will now present uh, uh, an example of this uh, characteriz of this characterization that will be uh, similar to the uh, biochemical and genetic characterization of the uh, selected lines. So this mutant is a pale green mutant uh, with a photosynthetic efficiency higher than the wild type under highlight conditions. And we were able to uh, identify the responsible mutation of the mutant um, falling in uh, a gene encoding for the CHLI or Xanta H protein which is involved in chlorophyll biosynthesis as part of the magnesium keratase complex. And this, up to now, this mutation is the only viable mutation in this gene found in barley. Next. So we, uh, we studied the effect of this mutation and energy into lysine substitution on the Mg keratase uh, complex. Uh, which is composed by four subunits. So initially, uh, we studied the accumulation of these four subunits by uh, immunoblots. We studied the uh, efficiency, the activity of the complex uh, through, uh, through uh, fluorescence analysis of the products using an in vitro assay from uh, using uh, protein extracts from leaves. And we also generated the protein models uh, to study the effect uh, in uh, the protein structure and or activity of the mutation. And as we can see, the uh, mutation could hamper the uh, binding and or the hydrolysis of ATP, uh, which is, uh, since CHLI is an uh, and ATPA is a protein and uh, the entire uh, complex activity is uh, strongly reduced in the mutant. Uh, so next, so with this, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Pesarezi, all the lab members and uh, all the collaborators that are helping us uh, in, in this project. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Paolo and Andrea, for two really interesting and insightful talks. Um, I um, maybe Andrea or Paolo, if you could just stop sharing your screen, um, that would be great. And I just wanted to ask if anyone had a question. Um, okay, well, I can't see anyone's hands up at the moment. So while you're thinking of a question, um, I have a question for Andrea. Um, so when you had your Clovina mutants, you said that you had seven that you took forward to further analyze. How did you prioritize those seven? Uh, so for the moment, we are analyzing uh, uh, five of them, but mm -hmm. the prioritizing was well not like our choice, but it was simply because uh, it was easier to uh, map the mutation for those mutant since they had the, the similar genetic background, so we can use uh, uh, the other mutants as uh, control for uh, each single mutant. So they compare each one, uh, and they compare each other. The other two mutants, we don't have the reference genome because it's uh, a line that uh, is not available anymore. 
and so it will be more tricky to to map them. So we prioritize those those five mutants, and uh, once we will uh, um, have the candidates uh, for the for the mutation, we will prioritize the ones that are more like fast to to genotype or more interesting based on uh, uh, the possible allele that we found. Thank you, Andrea. That's really that's mm -hmm. a great answer. If I can add on this, Kelly, the, the, the priority was obviously given to those lines that has a reduction of chlorophyll, but then maintains equal or has even higher photosynthetic performance. That, that, that was the criteria, the first criteria. So we are looking for plants with reduced chlorophyll content, but with either wild type or higher photosynthetic performance. And the lines that Andrea selected, the first seven, had all these characteristics. Brilliant. Thank you, Paolo and Andrea. Um, I still can't see any questions coming in on the chat. So I think I'll move to our second project of this afternoon. But of course, if people think of questions um, at some point during the next talk um, that are related to best crop, I'm sure we can go back to them if we have time at the end of the next part of the session. Okay, um, so next I would like to introduce Ernesto Igatu, um, who I'm sure many of you know um, very well. Um, and Ernesto is based at the CA CSIC in Zaragoza, um, and he's going to be um, talking to us um, about Recobar, which is another um, large project um, which is looking into diversity in old varieties and land races and how could we can use the adaptations present in these um, accessions to really mitigate against changing climate conditions. Um, so I'll just hand over to Ernesto. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So I will share screen. Sorry, it's not working. Try again. Okay. Okay, Kelly, uh, please let me know. Do you see the full screen or um, mode? I don't see it at the moment. Um, oh, okay. Oh. Um, Ernesto, you might have to leave the meeting and rejoin if you can't get your screen to share. Oh, oh now we can see it. But not the right one. That's perfect. We can see you in a state. Somehow it does not detect the other one. Sorry. There it is. Perfect. Okay. I'll turn to presentation mode. Okay. Let me know, what do you see? The good one or the other one? The other one, I'm afraid. The other one, okay, no worries. What about now? Perfect, looks great, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you. It's always better in the tech run. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to give this talk to present our project Ricobar. The full title, as you can see, is Recovering and Exploiting Old and New Barley Diversity for Future Ready Agriculture. This is a project funded in the 2022 uh, joint call between uh, SUSCROP and FACHI Joint Programming Initiative on Agrobiodiversity, which is the main keyword of the project. 
It was funded with one and a half million euros for three years. And of course, it focuses on barley. So I will start by explaining the rationale behind the project, then the resources we had uh, at our disposal and the experimental approaches we are following. So I want first to acknowledge all the partners of the consortium. These are nine organizations from seven countries. University College of Dublin with two teams led by Sonia Negrao and Tancredi Caruso, who will talk later on. University of Silesia at Katowice, Agatha Daskoska College. Crea from Italy, Alessandro Tondelli and Davide Guerra. University degli Studi di Milano, also with two teams, Laura Rossini and uh, Roberto Confalonieri and Livia Paleari. University of Helsinki, Alan Schulman. Uh, Luke from Finland, Sirja Vitala, University of Tartu, Hannes Kolist, uh, Kukulova University from Turkey, Hakan, Oskan, and Sesik from Spain, myself. Most of them were present in the kickoff meeting that took place in Zaragoza just one year ago. And uh, besides these partners, we also have the support of Turkish company Tekfentarim and four agricultural organizations in Italy and Spain who will participate in demonstration trials later on in the project. Well, as you know, crop production faces many challenges, some caused by climate, some for the need to produce in a sustainable and environmentally conscious manner. This project builds on a foundation of previous knowledge built during past collaborations of many of the uh, members of the consortium, and briefly, what we propose in Ricobar is a variety of approaches to broaden the genetic base of barley, including the exploration of the wide diversity harbored by all varieties and land races for adaptation to shifting climates. Well, we all know the consequences of climate change in agriculture. There will be, there will be winners and losers in terms of crop yields, but for sure there will be change everywhere. And that change includes variety of replacements, and increased tolerance to stresses. Europe has already experienced a considerable migration of agroclimatic zones towards the north over the last 40 years, as you can see in these two figures, showing the types of climate experience in Europe in the past and in the near future. So, depending on the zones, increased stress occur occurrence and reductions of windows of favorable conditions are already affecting the growth cycle of the new cultivars. Another driver for change uh, comes from the EU policies in agriculture and the pressure to increase sustainability of agricultural productions. And in the current farm to fork strategy, a 20% reduction in fertilizer use and an increase of 25% of organic agriculture by 2030 is sought. The last driver for our project is the reduction of diversity observed in barley, particularly in the spring to road pool, the most important economically. As shown here, or, uh, these diversity clouds made with molecular marking information from the genotypic panels used in two successive projects, Klimbar, which is the blue cloud, and Barista, with more modern cultivars in the red cloud. This reduced diversity is a result of highly su successful breeding, which is still working. However, it seems sensible to try to expand barley diversity in light of the challenges ahead. So, this is the general outline of the project. We do not start from scratch. We have previous knowledge on several germplasm collection of barley accessions covering a range of breeding history from land races up to uh, elite uh, cultivars. Up to 1800 genotypes were studied over past projects. Diversity, agronomics, and stress responses for a few of them. So, first of all, a core collection of about 100 accessions will be tested across six countries under low nitrogen conditions. In parallel, a phenology diverse set of 30 lines will also be tested. A mini core collection of 10 genotypes is uh, being used for studying stress responses under control conditions. 
and a smaller set, we call it the uh, microcore of six accessions will be used for microbiome analysis, which will be covered by my colleague Tancredi Caruso in the second part of the seminar. Data from these and past projects is being used to improve functional crop growth models, aiming at improving genotype performance predictions compared to standard genomic prediction. So to expand barley diversity, we have gone south to find germplasm potentially adapted to heat and drought. In project Gendibar, we assembled a reference set of Mediterranean land races for about 1,200 uh, accessions. And some of them were tested for heat tolerance and the best were included in the Recovar set. Besides going south, we have gone to the past to explore European land races and heritage cultivars that may hold traits like water logging resistance and good growth with limited nitrogen fertilization by using this exhibit European Heritage Barley Collection. This exhibit collection gathers two road spring barleys cultivated in Europe over time with a special emphasis on UK, Central Europe and Scandinavia. You can find more information in this recent article. Over past projects, we have tried genomic prediction equations. They were developed for a training set of 151 old cultivars, two row spring barley old cultivars, and validated on a newer set of 61 modern cultivars. These results of classic genomic prediction will be used as the baseline to compare predictions from functional modeling during Recovar. Besides a core set of land races and all cultivars, another collection that will be tested in a field trial network across Europe is a set of uh, 30 backcross lines on highly successful cultivar RGT Planet. These uh, 30 lines were selected from over 600 lines of a nested association mapping population developed at the Jens Hutton Institute and tested in Italy and Spain. These lines were selected based on their good agronomics and their growth cycle difference with the recurrent parent RGT planet from 14 days earlier up to 10 days later. As you know, climate change is affecting growth cycle duration, shortening or lengthening growth periods depending on latitude and climate. Genes controlling flowering time are essential for cultivar adaptation, and this set, selected for good agronomics, is a nice test rig for growth cycle duration across European cultivation zones. Oops, sorry, didn't work and now it's running. Yeah, here. And lastly, different plant materials and fundamental knowledge were developed in previous projects from different streams of work identified from GWAS analysis or from dedicated phenotyping experiments. Two examples are heat tolerant Mediterranean accessions, which were identified in the Gendiver project and knowledge on key features, QTLs and candidate genes of corn traits related to lodging tolerance that will be studied further in, tolerant, in uh, Ricobar. But I leave out other materials due to time limit. And now starting with the development of the project, barley accessions to supply seed for the project were multiplied in Zaragoza and Dublin, harvested in 2023. And the mini core accessions were already distributed last year, and some experiments are ongoing. The first field trials are growing in Turkey, Italy, and Spain, and will be sown in spring in Finland and Ireland. The two main sets of germplasm, the core collection and the NAM nested association mapping derived lines, are being tested in field trials under low fertilization and abiotic stresses in parallel to current allele cultivars and checks, as checks, sorry. We aim at identifying promising accessions for direct use, pre-breeding and gene mining. This is the composition of the core set with emphasis on land races, 
and heritage cultivars, and also um, yeah, land traces and old cultivars. Sorry. On top of it, a small set of accessions better suited to northern or southern sites are being tested only in those locations. The best accessions found in the first year of trials this year will be distributed to collaborating farmers and companies in the second year to evaluate their possible direct use. Well, I must confess that I was skeptic about the direct use of Mediterranean land races for current cultivation in Europe, but some of them were really astounding, outstanding in yield at the multiplication plots. They still may have disease resistance issues though, and some showed uh, pro uh, were prone to lodging, but I'm curious to see the results of the field network. Work package two aims at mining new traits and genes for tolerance to abiotic stresses. It will focus on already developed or developing materials and existing genomics resources. Tests developed to examine responses to specific stresses or conditions like drought, heat, auto logging, high CO2, and lodging will be carried out for at least the mini core collection. For gene discovery, we will carry out in silico allele mining using abundant genomic resources like exome capture, whole genome sequencing, and trans transcriptome sequencing for a list of candidate genes. We will also do some low pass sequencing of a few accessions which lack genomics resources at this point. Within World Package 2, drought tolerance experiments will be carried out at CREA in Italy with their new plant array platform of computerized lysimeters. They will also characterize stomatal morphology using a handheld microscope and heat tolerance will be tested in Zaragoza, Spain, using an already tested method using shifts between greenhouses at different temperatures at the most sensitive stage of spike development. Also in World Package 2, the University of Silesia carries out drought and recovery experiments and combined, combined drought and heat experiments on seedlings with tested protocols and a thorough monitoring of physiological traits. University College in Dublin will carry out water logging tests under control conditions using an optimized protocol. They also have um, field data and water logging from past field experiments. The data collection will include analysis of root development. Um, Finally, in work package two, there, is, there are few certainties about future climate. Uh, one certainty about future environmental conditions is that is the increase of atmospheric CO2. So the University of, of Tartu is responsible for studying responses of the mini core collection to high CO2 conditions in multi cuvette systems. Oh, sorry, there was another one in work package two. Uh, the lodging uh, experiments are carried out by the University of Milano. They follow a reverse genetic approach for the most relevant traits identified in past studies. Mutants from the Chilean population Tilmore, showing large column diameter, were crossed to the wild type, and candidate genes will be sold by phenotyping the uh, and bulk segregant analysis of the F2 populations. Work package three deals with uh, modeling. Traditionally, plant breeding has worked in a reactive manner, developing new cultivars in response to new pathogen races, societal demands, or commercial pressures. In the climate change scenario, however, present field environments do not faithfully reflect field conditions 10 years from now. So, the traits and materials needed to respond to the future target environments, which are moving in different conditions across Europe, must be identified and deployed early enough into the breeding pipeline to deliver effective solutions from the conditions for the conditions they are aimed at 10, 20, 40 years from now. Livia Pagliari and Roberto Confalonieri from the Cassandra Lab at the University of Milano are responsible for this work package. This is the outline of work package three, and I have to confess that I am out of my depth here. 
But summarizing, this work package aims at extending available crop models and integrating them with genomic prediction and ideotyping approaches to expected shifts in agroecosystems due to climate change. Also, it aims at identifying adaptation strategies to mitigate negative impacts. Models will be improved by incorporating key biotic and abiotic factors to improve simulation of uh, barley growth and development. The improved models will make use of the biological range of stress responses measured in Work Package 2 and will be tested against field results of past projects and recovery. The climate change scenarios will be simulated to test barley performance under future conditions. And one nice uh, output of this work is that predicted barley performance in future climate will lead to tips about suitable barley ideotypes for specific geographic regions. Also, model-aided genomic prediction will be attempted for phenological traits. For this purpose, data from past projects was used to parameterize genotypic responses and associate them to specific SNPs. These relationships will be used to derive model-based predictions. The future climate projections are being calculated using different future CO2 and general circulation model scenarios to buffer against bias uh, of using single scenarios. Predictions for 2040 and 2060 are being generated for a total of 80 climate scenarios. Well, these are the locations that provided the data sets from past projects used to train the models uh, used for climate characterization and future climate prediction. And this work is well advanced. Some more locations must be added to work with all sites relevant to RICOBAR. An additional activity of the Cassandra lab, who are models that go to the field as much as the average breeder, is the development of smart apps for crop monitoring. These tools, like this app, used to uh, fine tune, uh, to estimate the, the nitrogen content of crops, are used to fine tune models, but are also potentially useful for plant phenotyping. Now, this app is actually being calibrated for selected mini core genotypes in the RICOBAR field trials. Well, if you are interested in the project, we are already distributing a newsletter and the advances will be published in our website and announced in this social media. Well, that was all from my side. And now Tancredi Caruso will explain the work on soil microbiota carried out in Work Package 4. And I will take questions after that. Thank you. Um, so I should stop sharing now, right? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you, Ernesto. So thank you, Ernesto, for a, a fantastic overview of the Reco Bar project. It's really sounds really interesting. Um, and I'd like to hear more about it. But for the moment, um, our next speaker, Tancredi Caruso, um, is unable to be here to present this talk in person. However, we will be able to um, watch a video of this talk. Please continue to put questions in the chat box as well if you want to ask questions later. Hello, this is Tancredi Caruso. I am an associate professor of ecology in University College Dublin, and I'm here to talk about uh, work package four of the project Rico Bar. And I believe that um, Ernesto has given me already a broad introduction to this project. And, um, and first of all, uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there live. And thank you to the organizer for allowing um, transmitting a recording of this presentation. So in work package four of Rico Bar, we are looking at uh, the rhizosphere microbiome associations uh, along uh, a diversity gradient in barley under different environmental conditions and also stresses. Um, 
the reason why we're doing that is that we wish to add um, rhizos fear microbes and possibly also some aspect of the transcriptomics of rhizos fear microbes to all the traits that characterize uh, different genotypes of barley. There is some good evidence um, for some uh, accessions and genotypes that um, barley has a relatively rich rhizosphere microbiome community and that there is a connection between this rhizosphere microbiome and the health of the plant. And uh, for example, there are different um, varieties of barley that um, are capable of uh, our vascular mycorrhizal fungi colonization, which is a trait uh, that uh, is typical of grasses in general, and that uh, anecdotally may be lost in some, um, uh, through some selection of breeds, specifically uh, conceived to be highly productive under uh, situations of high input of fertilizers, for example. Um, and yet, barley is one of those crops that uh, maintains a, a relatively great ability to establish mycorrhizal symbiosis. Um, uh, uh, but there isn't very much knowledge about uh, the role of um, AMF in general for different uh, types of barley. Um, and uh, the same is true for other types of fungi, including the potentially pathogenic ones, as well as bacteria. Um, so um, in this work package, we will be focusing on uh, six particular genotypes among all those that are explored through the various work packages of the project. And those six have been selected to kind of describe the entire gradient of genotypic diversity we have in the various cultivars of barley that are examined in the project. Um, the, the basic idea hypothesis also is that any change in environmental conditions or stress that we apply above the ground to the plant will cascade to the roots and so to the rhizosphere. So it will affect the composition of the microbes, but also um, the, uh, the transcription, the activity of the genes that are expressed by the microbial community. Uh, it may also determine the degree of uh, uh, mycorrhizal colonization in the, uh, in the crop. Um, uh, and so eventually, maybe one of those traits that we may look to look at when we search for uh, genotypes that are, for example, resistant or resilient to certain types of stress, such as drought or maybe water loggings of soil. Um, so we will characterize the, the rhizosphere microbiome uh, within a, a gradient of barley diversity. And to do that, we are concentrating on um, six, six genotypes of which two are land races, two are heritage, and two are elite cultivars. A few more details uh, in the next few slides. And uh, potentially, this is information that can allow us to identify microbiota barley associations that are particularly resistant or resilient to a range of more or less extreme environmental conditions. To do that, we are basically uh, doing experiments with these genotypes across a number of sites in Europe to cover basically the west, the east, the south, and the north under low and standard nitrogen input. We will do amplicon sequencing of the rhizosphere, bacteria and fungal communities to characterize these two major groups, and also some transcriptomics work uh, of the same microbes. And then we have a package of network data integration and modeling, uh, a task actually within the work package. Uh, the genotypes that we're going to look at are two old cultivars, Gold Promise and Oli. And then uh, the lab races you can see there, and also some modern cultivar, like uh, in particular, we could use Alastro and LG Diablo. Um, and uh, we're going to grow all the six genotypes in uh, each of the five countries you see here in the, in the map under low and standard nitrogen uh, inputs through replicate plots. Um, however, at the moment, uh, in terms of this is work we're going to do mostly uh, in the spring. Uh, in the autumn, depending on the genotypes. 
but uh, in the meantime, we have been looking at uh, barley grown under water logging condition, and this is work done by um, Sonia Negrau, who is a colleague of mine in UCD, who is in fact the PI for re -Eco Bar, the Irish package. Although I'm leading the work package, Sonia is actually leading uh, in terms of the overall Irish contribution. And so she helped my group to basically uh, start exploring microbial uh, molecular approach in the fringe types of barley. So we have this pilot study in which we are basically piloting our techniques to do uh, to sequence um, the right sphere and also to, to do to, to estimate root colonization of AMF in, in a number of genotypes, of which uh, one is actually one of those that we'll be using also in uh, for re eco bar and you can see here some replicated plots of barley uh that some are controlled and other are waterlogged and um and we have been harvesting this barley plot uh, at the end of the last summer and uh and we have been uh, devising some uh, uh, standardized protocol to extract the registry microbial community uh if you are in registry microbes you will well know that uh, the recent a universal definition of what a red sphere microbial community is, because there isn't an exact border in terms of where the red sphere begins and where it ends. Uh, it's more of a holistic definition. It is all the microbes in the strictest neighborhood of uh, plant roots, um, say very few microns, maybe a couple of millimeters. And you can think of this of all the microbes you can get from the soil strictly adhering to plant roots. And so there are different ways of, uh, of with different protocols in the literature uh, that more or less are all a variation around shaking the coarse soil from the, from the harvested entire plant uh, to centrifugal vortex roots um, in different steps so that eventually you remove all the soil that is strictly adhering to the roots and, um, uh, and you pellet it uh, into a falcon tube and then you can selectively going to extract DNA from those uh, from from that soil as a representative uh, of uh, the right to see a community there now because you never know how this type of methods work with different types of plants um, we wanted to pilot this on barley and we can say that uh, uh, it worked very well our DNA yield from this type of sample they were very very good um, so then we were going to do applicant sequencing. This is my, my group mostly doing this work. And um, uh, in particular, uh, Shivani Katri is a postdoc working on this project. He's leading on this on this piece of work. And then also an MSC research student, Elia, has been helping with the pilot. And we are targeting the ITS uh, region for the fungi and the 16S um, region for, for the bacteria. And we have also some plans to, to actually investigate AMF Vascular microbes of fungi specific primers to target that community. Um, but in general, we're going to work on, on all of the fungi and all of the bacteria. Um, and so we we do we you know we we do uh, PCR of those fragments and then we we do amplicant sequencing, uh, I truth pool amplicant sequencing uh, of those PCR products to profile the microbial uh, community. Um, uh, alongside, um, alongside, and, and actually, what I can say already is that we are just we just got a few days ago uh, the sequencing result from the from the from the water logging experiment conducted at UCD, and uh, we can already see very well, uh, for example, that the, the there is a clear difference between the structure of the communities under water logged and control conditions. And, uh, and in some cases, some um, um, very clear difference between, um, between uh, the genotypes, between the genotypes. So um, some genotypes do respond more to water logging than others. And that's important to us to have seen at the pilot stage, because it means that our background hypothesis is probably holding true and that uh, it's an important trait for different types, genotypes of barley to respond to stresses like uh, water logging. Uh, but it's again a pilot stage if in order to really show that we will need the real data from the, the entire study. 
Alongside the, the amplicon sequencing work, we're doing some transcriptomics work, and this is mostly uh, done at the University of Silesia, our colleague Agata Daskowska, who for some of, of the sites and the location, we will, uh, we will um, look into transcriptomics. Uh, and in particular, we will look into genes that are known to be associated to magnification, phosphate, and that's important given that we have a low nitrogen input and the standard uh, nitrogen input. Uh, phosphate solubilization, which is also again important given the fertilization regime in the soils. The synthesis of phytohormones, which is important for plant-plant interaction, but also the interaction between plants and microbes, for example, interactions with uh, pathogens and antagonists of the pathogens. Uh, and, and also, and so that's why you can see there are phytopathogen control, um, induced resist systemic resistance, um, uh, reduction of oxidic damage. Um, this is because one of the first things that may happen uh, to, to any plant, but in particular to crop under stress, it's a weakening of the immune system, and so an increased susceptibility to uh, soil-borne diseases. So that's why our colleagues in Poland are looking at that particular <coughs> types of genes. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the amount of data generated by this type of work, usually it's enormous. Uh, because that's a reflection of the enormous diversity of, uh, of the microbes. And we're going to tackle that complexity with two types of modeling. One is network reconstruction methods, which uh, I'm leading on, uh, in which we associate different genotypes of barley under different conditions to different microbes or transcriptomic responses. And uh, in doing that, we create network objects that uh, are, have the same structure of a plant pollinator objects in a way. So what we call bipartite networks in which one set of nodes in the networks is one biological group, for example, the genotypes, and the other set of nodes is the microbes in this case. And that's one way uh, to digest the complexity of these communities across different locations and genotypes. And the other thing we're doing is uh, multivariate approaches in general, including structural equation modeling to basically connect the multiple response of, of, of the plant in the field, especially the geno, the, 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 the microbial responses, to the variety of environmental conditions and co-variable we have uh, in, in our sites, things like soil pH, and kind of matter in the soil, and so on. Uh, the, the basic idea is that if you take one particular variable, say productivity on the y-axis, this will change over time uh, as a function of perturbation, because the perturbation will change the network of associations between um, the microbes, for example, and the genotypes. And, and then after the perturbation ends, there is also potentially a, a phase of, uh, of recovery that uh, uh, may take the, the community to a new state or maybe the original state. Um, and uh, in particular, you know, the type of objects we're going to generate, and this is some preliminary data from our files, they look like this. So you see here, these black nodes in the center of these clouds of, of blue, blue clouds with gray dots. This is, this is representing a plant, in this case, barley genotype one, say, and two and three and four and five and six. So we're going to work with six genotypes. And then each of these little gray dots is a microbe, or it could be also a gene. But in this case, it's a microbial taxon. And uh, you know, the edges, of uh, they, they represent a connection. So all these microbes here are unique to barley genotype one, while this one are shared between genotype one and genotype six. And there will be others that are in the middle of, of the network that are shared between multiple uh, genotypes. And so with these types of objects and with metrics that quantify those objects, we, we are trying to answer questions such as, as barley genotypes share, do they share a common microbiome or each of them as their own microbiome? So these networks, are they, <clears throat> do they have a so-called core periphery structure in which you have a core microbiome and then satellites, microbial species that may or may not perform important functions locally? Or is it more that each genotype has its own microbiome because they are specifically adapted to the local conditions, 
or maybe to the type of disturbances they are used to or they have been selected uh, for. This is the type of questions. And in order to answer those questions, uh, you need a robust statistical description uh, of the microbiomes, and you need to look at that description across genotypes, country, and uh, conditions, which we are, we're going to do with this network in um, So that's, uh, that's my contribution. I tried to keep it short, given it's just a recording, so I have no way of taking very many questions, actually. But please do, do collect your question. Uh, maybe send them to Ernesto, maybe many of them, Ernesto will be able to answer. Or just contact me if you, if you have more questions. And in this final slide, just uh, acknowledge the contribution of those specific people who are working on Work Package 4 and, of course, our founders. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, Tancredi and um, Ernesto, for a couple of really interesting and insightful talks about the Record Bio project. Um, I was just wondering if anybody online has any questions um, about the Record Bio project for Ernesto. Um, I can't see anybody putting their hands up at the moment. So. Ernesto, I had a question about the um, the app that you mentioned towards the end of your talk that had been developed to measure nitrogen in the field in leaves. Is that sorry, possible? Kelly? I couldn't understand the question. <laughs> sorry, um, I had a question about the app that you mentioned oh, yeah. towards the end of your talk that yes. had been developed to measure nitrogen levels in the leaves yeah. while you're actually in the field. Um, is that is that available to use on barley? Has it been developed for um, another crop or? Well, um, what I can tell you is that uh, it has been developed in, in Milano by Roberto and Livia, mm -hmm. and they have tested it on genotypes of their choice. But if you want to use it for a particular genotype, you have to calibrate it for that particular genotype, you know, taking the typical uh, yeah. Dumas or Kjeldal nitrogen measurements on top of the uh, app measurements. Uh, this is something that we are doing now in the project. And whereas for use in other crops, well, my guess is that it could be used in other crops, at least in closed crops, but uh, these questions really should be addressed to, to Roberto and Livia. Okay. No, that's I mean, I, I, we we are really really hopeful about this app. Uh, after the calibration is done, we we think it's going to be very useful. Yeah, I can imagine it'll be so useful, and it'll be so useful mm -hmm. for a lot of other projects and a lot of other groups as well. It would be fabulous to be able to get that sort of um, phenotyping in the fields um, in such a high throughput way. It'd be yeah, it'd be great. Um, okay. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or anyone. But I'm putting their hands up just now. So I think. Or, or for um, Paolo, who is still there. <laughs> for Paolo, yeah, no, I don't see any questions either um, coming in for either of any of you or, um, in the chat either. So um, I think I'll draw this to a close. I'd like to just thank again um, our four speakers today, Paolo, Andrea, Ernesto, and Tancredi, um, for some really excellent, exciting um, talks about what's going on um, in these large scale um, projects. Um, the recording will be available shortly on the IBH website. And just to say that the next um, seminar will be on the 21st of March in two weeks' time, and the speaker will be Eva Oberger. Um, from Vienna. So um, thank you all for joining us and see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you to you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.